Faye, uh, are you? We're gonna get started here in a second. Let me. Yeah, if you want to come up, and we'll go ahead and get you mic'd. There you go. All right. So we've got. Uh, we actually have digital mics this year. So Sylvain, you got your work cut out for you. If you can try to fuzz me again. All right. Um, Let's get rolling. OK, uh, I'm just going to kick the conference off with some logistics. And then I'm going to hand it off to our first keynote. So oh, where's Derek? Somebody yell out to Derek Cazell. I need my laser pointer. <laughs> All right, so I tried to point stuff out here uh, on the map. But just to go through this real quickly, um, so we since I don't have a laser pointer. Can you see my mouse pointer right now? Anybody? Anybody? No? No. OK. Uh, I'm going to stand. Well, it's not helpful. OK. So this long building on the side of Gleason Road is where we are now. Uh, and I know everybody's trying to come up through these two elevators. There's actually more ways to get up and down out of this room, which we are going to need to use because all 300 of you are going to be coming and going several times throughout the day for food and breaks and that sort of thing. So there are two elevators there, obviously, which I think all of you have used. Um, directly, if you walk past those elevators on that far wall, there's two double doors. If you open those double doors, it's going to look like you've trapped yourself in a storage room. You have not. If you go left through those double doors, there's a staircase to take you all the way down. Um, also, right in the back of the room here, over near the food is another set of double doors that you can go down that takes you down uh, what is kind of a creepy staircase. But it's back there. It'll take you all the way down to the bottom floor. You can get out. You'll be good. Over here is another elevator and another set of stairs. So you have three elevators and three large sets of stairs. Please make use of them so everyone's not cramming down the same two. Otherwise, we're going to spend the entire lunch period with all of you waiting in line. Uh, so we have made a change. The program is already wrong. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, it says that the tutorials are in the Del Mar room. Uh, we checked it out, and we've actually decided to swap that. So our two breakout rooms for most of the week are the Del Mar and the Shell. Uh, so the tutorials today, tomorrow, and Wednesday are actually going to be in the Shell room. So I do have these called out here on the map. Uh, you can see the Del Mar. So uh, for those, the, oh, fantastic. You know, now that I have this, I'm realizing I don't have a screen behind me to, to use it on. Uh, all right, so uh, anyways, the Del Mar breakout room, if you, so this is the lobby is directly behind us here. If you head to the right of the lobby, stage right, uh, and you're walking towards the gift shop, and you, walk towards the, and you walk to the left of the gift shop, there's going to be an entrance for the Del Mar room right there. So if you're near the gift shop, you should be able to see the door to the Del Mar room. The shell breakout room is actually on the opposite side of the building. So stage left, you walk to the left of the lobby. Um, if you've seen that restaurant area, the little pond where they actually have live seals, uh, walk past that, and you turn right. You're basically walking through the end of the restaurant seating area. You walk into the building there, and the shell room is at the end of the hallway. Uh, so the shell room is where the tutorials will be. Um, as a quick show of hands, uh, who plans on attending one of the tutorials today? Oh boy! All right, uh, let's, let's let's do this differently. Uh, as a quick show of hands, who plans on attending the GPL tutorial today? All right, all right. Uh, the uh, starting from scratch, how do you get going tutorial? All right, pretty good number. And then the digital comms. OK, cool. This will work. Uh, lunch today is in the pond, not actually in the water, but in that pond area where the seals are. Uh, should be nice. And lastly, tonight, we have a drink social sponsored by the Hume Center. Thank you, Hume Center. Where's the Hume, where's the Hume table? There we go, Hume table. Thank you, guys. We've got drinks. You all should have drink tickets. Uh, please do not lose them. They are prepaid tickets. And uh, the drink social is just right here on the beach. So in terms of parking, uh, anyone who is parked at the ho or anyone who's staying at the hotel has free parking. 
Uh, anyone who is not staying at the hotel, you can park here along Gleason. This is all beach parking. And there's a, I'm realizing you can't see my mouse pointer, and right at the corner, right before you turn into here, is a really large city lot right on the beach that's open and free parking. You can park there. It's not even a tenth of a mile. It's right here on the corner. You can see it through the window. That is open and free parking. Uh, the only heads up we got from the venue, as I think she said, on t Tuesdays and Thursdays, don't park in the spaces that sit on the grass. But there's a huge lot, and there's many, many other spaces. If you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, we already went through our schedule for today, so everyone's in here in the morning. We're going to break for lunch on the pond. Uh, we're going to split into dual track sessions. Tutorials will be in the shell, despite what the program says. All the technical talks will remain here. Okay, panels. So we once again have two panels this year. We are going to do something a little bit different. Uh, questions are going to have to be submitted before the panel. We will not take questions during the panel. Uh, and your questions will be screened. Uh, that does not mean that we aren't going to take hard questions. Uh, actually, I, I, I really want for the panels this year to be uh, kind of tough, honest conversations. Uh, but I do want to make sure that the questions are productive. So uh, I will be, I actually meant to do this before we started today. Uh, I'm going to hand out a bunch of index cards or leave them on the tables. Uh, if you have a question for the panel session, just write it on an index card and come give it to any of the organizers. Uh, we'll stick it in a bag, we'll screen it, we'll combine questions that are roughly the same, and then uh, we'll have the panel moderated using your questions. Uh, actually, if you want to write your name on it for attribution of the question, that's great, but you don't have to. If you want to ask an anonymous question, you can. Uh, and so this is, this is true for both today's panel and Thursday's panel. Uh, so today's panel is going to be a little bit of a, something of a town hall. Uh, so it'll be myself, uh, Jonathan Corgan, and Martin Braun, your three officers of the Green Radio Foundation and the primary leads of the project. And the goal of it is to answer any questions you have about the project, the community, the direction, uh, how are we paying for things, uh, what, what isn't happening, what we need help doing, any questions that you have about what is happening in the project, uh, that, that is the goal. And feel free to be tough, right? It's, a, it's an open source project, we're an open community. Um, our goal isn't to, to hide anything, we're not trying to be opaque. So this is your, your chance to, to chat with us and uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, again, drink socials, so that it starts at 6 p.m. It's going to run until 7.30. We are not serving dinner. Uh, it is it is a drink social only, but there is oh I didn't put it on the map um, just around the corner here. If you go to the end, turn right on Mission. That's the strip with tons of restaurants and bars. Uh, we do have a code of conduct again this year. Please abide by it. It rough says roughly what it thinks it, what you think it should say. Uh, it, don't be a jerk. Don't harass people. We will kick you out if you do. Uh, if you witness something or uh, something happens to you, please, you can use this email address, you can use this phone number, or you can ask any event staff. We will handle it. Uh, oh, I did put it in here. Yep, so we're at the Bahia right here on the over right. If you walk over to Mission Bay and take a right, you can see this stretch of restaurants and bars. Again, these are your organizers. Uh, I'm Ben. Uh, I was Philip, and I think actually most of the organizers are out at the registration desk. Um, is Philip Ballister in here? No, Derek? Registration desk, Jose. That's Jose. Jose, if you could stand up. Trip, Tim O'Shea, Neil, everyone's at the registration desk. Michelle, okay. Um, if you need any of us, just find us. And that's it. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to our first keynoter. Are you all mic'd up and ready to go? Doesn't sound like it. So uh, similar to what we did last year, uh, we, we really try to use the keynotes to uh, uh, not throw more math at you. Uh, our, our keynotes are meant as kind of a, a different perspective, sometimes different topics. Um, this year, actually, uh, I think two of our three keynoters have never touched GNU Radio before. Uh, so the, the goal really is to kind of bring an outside perspective and, and talk about things that we really probably wouldn't be talking about otherwise in the conference. Uh, so we're really, really happy to have Faye here to talk about continuing education, uh, which I, as I imagine many of you are using as justification to be here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you, Faye. Test, test. Is this better? Can you hear me? Oh, you want to use your laptop? Yes. 
Oh, Let me switch it over. Yeah, my apologies. There you go. Is this too loud? Can you hear me good? All right. So are you all enjoying San Diego? Has anyone gotten a chance to see part anything yet? Anything fun? Zoo? I have to admit today as a San Diegan, I'm a little bit sadder than normal because it's the first week of football and I have no football team. Yes. Am I connected? Is it on? I can't see. Okay. You guys are going to tell me if you can't see my slides or anything or you can't hear me, right? You're going to do this and say hi. All right. Great. So, um, good morning. Oh, yes. You're, oh, you're on a, your extended desktop. Okay. Hold it. We have the technology. You guys are all just watching me now type, huh? This is like, it's a lot of pressure here. It, we do want extend, right? Well, I don't really want mirror because I want to be able to see my notes here, and I don't want you all to necessarily read my notes. Because when I say things like, see if the audience really is paying attention, you know, then you guys will have a hint. I don't want to duplicate. Is this better? OK. All right, I did nothing different then stop and say slideshow, but hey. Okay, well, so now that we've windows. gotten that over with, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Now that we've gotten my little faux pas over with, now it's all good, and now the presentation is gonna go smoothly, and I'm sure. So anyways, um, a little bit about me. Um, I have an undergrad degree in math computer science. I have an MS in information systems and an MBA, both of which I earned while working full time. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, in the presentation. Um, I started my career here in San Diego at NCR, which then became Teradata. It's right here in Rancho Bernardo, which is about 20 miles east and north. Um, and then I got swept up into the Bay Area craze, and I went up to the Bay Area where I worked for HP and Cadence for a couple years, and then I got swept up into the crazy um, startup phase. So um, I actually worked at one of the first ebook companies up in the Bay Area. Uh, it was an interesting time because um, we were going through an acquisition, and we were being purchased by Gemstar TV Guide, and they brought me in pretty much to just have someone put structure and lots of processes in place so that we were a more um, attractive. Don't, can't be waving in the middle. I said wave to me. Okay. Um, uh, a more ac attractive acquisition target. So um, it was really great. We sold for one year at Best Buy, and then it went away. And then five years later, Amazon and Kindle came around and swept the market away. And after that, um, it's kind of interesting because the original founders of the ebook company um, said, hey, we're going to go off and do another project. And you know, the ebook was really fun, but I'm really a software person. And so there was a lot of mechanical design, there was a lot of hardware. And I just said, you know, I just don't know if I want another hardware project. So I'm going to go and do this really cool software startup. We're going to do data visualization. It's all the craze. It's going to be so much fun. The original founders of that ebook company, they went on to be the founders of Tesla Motors. And so um, that was, uh, yes, Mark Tarpening, yeah, exactly. Uh, Mark Tarpening and Martin Eberhardt. I know a lot of people think Elon Musk, and he actually came around and gave them the first round of funding and gave them a lot of connections. But the original, for the first year and a half, the designers of the project were were my good buddies. So anyways, but it's all good because now I get to go visit them in their vacation homes. I don't, and, and yeah. And uh, so I did the data visualization company for about five years when they decided, the VCs decided they were going to move the company to Texas for some reason. And I said, you know what? 
Love the Bay Area and all, but I'm really a San Diego girl at heart, so moved back to San Diego, did some management consulting, at which time UCSD found me because they were actually going to launch some new master's degrees and they said, hey, do you want to come and help with this? And I'm like, sure, I'll come and take a look at it. So anyways, here we are today. See, and if I went off to do the Tesla motor thing, I wouldn't be here today, so it's, it's all good. So here to talk to you about something that you guys already know. Times are changing, right? We have, um, we're living in a rapidly changing world. And how do we as engineers stay current and stay relevant um, and marketable, say, 5, 10, 20, 30 years after graduating? So before I go on, however, I want to talk a little bit about education versus learning. And I really love this quote. Education is what people do to you. Learning is what you do for yourself. So I'll be using both of these terms today. And the takeaway really is that it's your job to learn, whether it be through self-teaching or through the traditional methods of education, you know, a course, a certificate, a degree program. It could be online. It could be in person. Um, and now we have a lot of non-traditional methods as well, right? We have conferences such as this. We have user groups, forums, and these are all ways that you know, we can learn from, right? So. so continuing education can really be kind of grouped into two main categories. We've got the technical skills, and we have your non-technical skills, which a lot of people equate with business skills, but I really like to call them everyday skills. And I'd actually argue with you that everyday skills are just as important as technical skills in the workplace. What do you guys think? I see some nods. I see some heads shaking. So all right. Um, you aren't convinced, and that's OK. And it's not my job to convince you that they're equally important. I would just like you to believe that they're somewhat important. So your first quiz for the day, true or false? So if you're technically strong, if you're you know, an architect, if you're a key contributor, as I like to say, you know, some people, and we all have worked with people like this, right, who think that they're all that and a bag of chips, then it's OK if you don't have the best everyday skills because your tech skills will keep you employed. True or false? Very good. Did you guys see the answers already? OK. So. Um, and it is. It's, it's not true. And one of the big reasons is that you know, your everyday skills are your communication skills. It's what you use to work with people daily. I have this story that I like to share um, when I was at Cadence. Um, Cadence has a very interesting um, management style and model. So what they do is they put somebody like me who is good at managing things, but maybe not quite as technical, and that's OK, because what they do is they have some very senior technical architect types who help drive the project. So I was working in a group. We did physical verification tools. And we had about 40 or so engineers and three architects. And the architect's job was really to help design, um, come up with the cool algorithms. One of our architects was a very, um, very senior, you know, genius type person. He actually uh, finished his PhD from Oxford at, you know, 23, one of those. And he had done some amazing things for our products. He helped us speed up one of our products more than 10x, you know, over a weekend. And we were just like, oh my gosh, how did he do it? And his role really was not only to, you know, work on some of the design, but also to help uh, mentor the more junior engineers to actually do the implementation. Our problem with this guy was that brilliant as he was, after a couple years, we were just finding that it was impossible to work with him. Things would happen like, you know, he would, one day he'd be, you know, helpy, helpful, the next day he wouldn't want to communicate, he didn't want to write anything down, he just wanted to be able to talk to people and tell people what was going on. And I have to tell you that at one point when um, we had to do a reduction in force, it was about four years after he'd been hired, we actually chose to let him go, and we let him go to a competitor, knowing that as brilliant as he was, he couldn't work with other people. And because of that, you know, it's, 
It's not just the technical skills. You know, he was brilliant. We really wanted, and we really had a lot of discussions. It actually went all the way up to VP level, um, and it was decided that it wasn't the right thing to keep him. So really, you know, regardless of who you are and what you know, if you can't work with others, if you can't communicate, you know, it's, it's not enough. So, excuse me. So now hopefully you guys are somewhat convinced that you need to have some of these skills and you're saying, so where and how do I get these skills? Do I just use, get them from every day? Do I get an MBA? So um, before you go jumping down the track of an MBA, some few facts about an MBA. Um, in 2015, MBAs accounted for almost 35% of all graduate degrees conferred each year. What do you think the percentage of engineering degrees every year is? Guess? A little? We got two threes? Ten. Ten. Very, you win. It's actually about 9%. Uh, and just for fun, 28% are about our education degrees. And actually, um, almost 20% in the medical and health area. So, um, core curriculum of an MBA would include classes like accounting, econ, finance, marketing, HR, operations. Do I have any MBAers in the room? Whoa, one. Okay, it's the two of us. So, <laughs> so um, just to, so you guys know, you know, what, what do these people who take MBAs, what do they take? You know, accounting, econ, finance, they all kind of sound like the same, don't they? Just so you know, you know, what an accounting class is, is you know, you take a lot of classes, um, topics like revenue recognition, you learn about assets and liabilities, net present value, balance sheets, sound familiar? Remember all that? How often do you really use it? Not so often, some of it? Okay, good. All right. Um, econ, so there's micro and um, macroeconomics. There you're gonna learn about supply and demand, you've got taxes, you've got monopolies and cartels. So again, you know, it's kind of interesting while you're taking the class, so is it really something you use daily? Hmm. Um, finance, finance is really how money moves around the economy and businesses, you know, how are we getting funding? Again. HR, now HR is actually kind of interesting because we all work in, with other people, but you know, in MBA HR class, you're actually doing more work along the lines of um, employee labor relations, benefits, management. So again, another topic that may or may not you know, be of immediate application to um, an engineer. Operations, this one's actually, I think, probably one of the more relevant ones because it's really um, the interfacing between different organizations in a business. So the question is, you know, do these topics, um, you know, these core topics, which every person in an MBA program has to take, you know, does it really benefit an engineer or if you're, you know, more of a CTO type, more of a manager type, you know? I'd say yes, yes and no. I mean, I think it's an interesting degree. You definitely learn a lot. But in terms of direct applicability and helping um, you in your day-to-day -day job, maybe a little bit less. Um, you know, it was interesting for me, and I went into management. Um, the MBA did give me some street cred, I think, amongst VCs and customers um, uh, back in the day. Um, on the other hand, I almost felt like it made me lose credibility with engineer types, so um, that's why I joke that I actually threw on the MS and information systems as well so that I could at least talk with my engineers. So, um, something to consider maybe instead would be to do an M mini, what I call an M mini MBA. And I think there are three main topics that are of interest to folks. Um, one is essentials of business pro um, practice, and these classes will be called different things, but this is the class where I think you get the core um, parts of some of those programs I was talking, uh, classes I was talking about. So you'll have things like, you know, it is kind of interesting, and you probably, everyone should be able to read a balance sheet. All of you probably own stock in something, you get those prospectuses every year, and you probably just toss them, but it is interesting to be able to read something. I, I see people laughing. Um, so, um, 
you know, essential to business. The most important course, I actually think, is managing stakeholder relations. And that's got a big title, and it's like, what does that really mean? It really means knowing your audience. Um, as technical folks, engineers tend to just want to get down into the weeds and just kind of talk technical. You really need to recognize who it is that you're speaking to. If you're talking to your customer, if you're talking to someone giving you funding, if you're talking with your boss, you know, ev to every one of these, when they ask you how are things going, you want to give a different response to. You don't want to just dive in and say, well, I was coding this and I was working on this and the radio didn't do this, you know, and the radio does do this now and I added these 12 features. That's not necessarily the right way and the best way to communicate. So that's something very important. Um, leadership values and skills. Um, what message do you want to convey? Um, and that really depends, again, on what environment and where you are. So at this point now, we're going to have an audience participation exercise, OK? You guys all ready? All right. So you're about to have a meeting with your customer. Um, it's a pretty big meeting because he's, gonna, he's coming in to see where you guys are, check off the milestone. And if you guys um, do well, then you know, you'll get the award for the next next release. So he comes in, he's a little late, he's a little distracted, and um, he, I say to him, hey, Paul, how, how are things today? Can I get you a cup of coffee? Paul shakes his head and says, oh, you won't believe what happened. You know, as I was driving in, backed my car out of the driveway, the cat got out, I ran over my girlfriend's cat. I killed my girlfriend's cat. She was so upset. She's yelling. She's screaming. And you don't understand. She really loves cats. Um, in the last seven years that we've been going out, she's had four cats at any time. Well, now she only has three, but you know she has four cats. She was yelling, screaming, following me outside of the house. I, I just didn't know what to do. Um, and between the crying and the screaming, she just told me she was breaking up with me. This was it. And I just don't know what to do. And then he just looks at, looked at, looks at me. So what should I say? What, what are, what's the right thing to say to Paul at this point? Anyone? Someone? Reschedule. Reschedule the meeting. Yes, offer to reschedule. Good idea. Anything? Yes? I'm so sorry about the cat. Yes, that's a good one. I'm a dog person. <laughs> That's actually quite close, so <laughs> anything else? All right, so typical responses are yes. Do you want to reschedule the meeting? Um, you know, so sorry. Um, that, you actually are very close. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, go home, bring her flowers. Can I get you another cat? There are lots of different responses, <laughs> right? So, you know, we're assuming, though, we've made one big assumption. And that is that, you know, he, when he says, I don't know what to do, um, we're assuming that he wants to make it up to his girlfriend, right? Instead, what's really going on is Paul is actually is a dog person. And he's kind of tired of the girlfriend. And it, you remember? It's been seven years. Um, and he's, got, he's actually really excited. He's like, this is great. Now I'm done. And the I don't know what to do is like, he's got his motorcycle at her house. And he's really wondering, like, how am I going to get my motorcycle you know, <laughs> back home without her destroying my motorcycle? Um, so you, know, you really hit it spot on when you said, I'm really so sorry. Because you don't know where it is that he was going with his story. And you don't know the background behind it. So what you don't want to do is jump in and offer solutions. You don't want to jump in and say, hey, get her another cat. Hey, do something. And that's something that we all tend to do, right? You guys are all very analytical people. You guys are all very smart people. And sometimes people will start talking. And instead of listening, you guys will start formulating, oh, this is how I'm going to respond. Oh, this is how I'm going to solve the problem. And it's not necessarily a problem that you have to solve. So the correct answer would be something like, I'm sorry, that sucks, man. And just sit there and just let people talk. So a lot of times, you know, that's one of the key takes, takeaways in some of these skills that you need to, you know, we all need to practice. Um, 
And again, are these, is anything here like, you know, not common sense, things that you don't know? No, you, you guys know all of this, you know it, but sometimes you just need something, a class somewhere to kind of bring it, you know, to the forefront so that it's something that you actually think about so that you can apply it on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so enough MBA talk, enough everyday skills talk, um, technical learning. How do, you say, how do you stay current? There's new tools, new methodologies, new technologies. How do you show your employer, your investor, your customer that you are as competitive and that you are as on top of things as some of the newer grads? So, you know, a prime example of this would be, you know, machine learning for you radio folks. How many of you actually have formal education in machine learning? Actually, a few of you. But then there's a lot, you know, who, you know, you're going to pick it up as you go. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some of the ways that one can um, acquire this additional um, learning. So, um, self self study, right? Everybody knows um, that we can do this. You know, we've always had books and white papers around. There's new things now. There's YouTube's. There's edX's. There's Coursera's. Um, these these are great ways to learn. Um, you're doing it on your own. It's great for general knowledge for you to get familiar in a subject. However, I didn't want to really put cons, so I said beware of. You know, things to think about as you're just uh, doing self-study is that it really lacks the hands-on and collaboration. And I'm sure all of you agree that, you know, you can read about something, but unless you actually do something, it's not the same. It's funny because um, I'm watching some calculus videos, you know, and it's been many years since I've taken calculus. I don't do calculus on my day-to-day -day job. And I'm watching the videos, and they all make sense to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember this. Oh, yeah, limits, it's all good. And then he goes on to the next video, and it's been like, you know, three days since I watched the last video. And I've already forgotten. I'm like, okay, what does that continuous function mean again? And what's even versus odd? You don't, unless you actually do it. I'm not doing any homework problems in between. So, but unless you actually do it and get the hands on, you know, it's not the same. But it is a great way, like I said, if you just want to get familiar with something. You know, people keep talking about X. And I really would like to know just a little bit more about it. It's a good way to um, get that general knowledge just so you can talk. Um, another um, way, a little bit more interactive, forums, user groups, and blogs. I'm sure all of you are part of GNU Radio Forum, yes? Um, and it's great for interacting with other people working in the field, experts in the field, usually get a great response. Um, undocumented cases, meaning, you know, stuff that isn't, you know, necessarily written. I'm trying to do this, you know, is there, anyone else tried this? It's a great way for things like that. Um, something that you have to be aware of, you know, a lot of these are unmoderated um, forums. So if you, if they are, then you just have to make sure that you, you know, you filter through because there might be some people who think that they're experts, and they're not really. You also have conferences and sponsored, you know, training conferences. And I got, do you guys all see that picture down there? Do you recognize it? That's actually from last year. I actually found a photo from the GRCon 16 conference in Boulder last year. So, um, you know, conferences, training classes, you know, these are like the, the National Instruments um, does those training classes where you can be like they're certified and you take a little test, and, you know. They are, again, great for networking with other folks who are working in the field. It's a great way to learn what's going on in academia and research. You know, what are some of the newer things? What are other people working on that you may not have realized um, exists out there? It's also great for expanding your in-depth knowledge in a certain um, area or domain. Um, one of the things that it doesn't do, though, is that it's, it's pretty specific, usually, right? You're talking about a tool or technology. So if you're trying to get a broader um, scope of something, you may or may not get that. You may just get a focused area or focus group. You can also take a course or certificate. So just out of curiosity, how many people after finishing their degree have gone back and taken like an actual course for credit or gotten a certificate in something? So good number, maybe 25, 30% of you, so that's pretty good. Um, 
You can do these now in person or online. These are a little bit more effective for learning um, because you, they're actually hands-on. You get practice. Um, and it's a proven learning technique, right? This is, this is how we've gone to school. This is the best we have right now, which is that people, um, professors, lecturers come and tell you things. You go home, you listen, you take notes, you do homework, you practice, and you come back and you take a test to see how well you've done. So again, um, they can sometimes be narrowly focused. If you're taking a class, you're learning a skill or a tool or a technology, um, and it may not provide you with some of the depth that you're looking for. There are a slew of new master's degree programs um, designed for working professionals. Here's my next, quest next question. How many people were aware that most, most, I'd say of the top 20, 30 universities now, all have some sort of professional master's degree program? Okay. So, and again, um, I think everyone recognizes the value of a degree program. It's, um, you get the hands-on practice, you get the depth that you're looking for. Um, and I say recognize, respected, you know. You, it's something that you can actually put down on your resume and people go, oh, okay, well, he's got another degree in something. Um, things to be aware of is that it's, it takes a lot more time to do this, right? It's a real commitment. It's at least usually two-year commitment that you're looking at while you're working. Um, it's a lot more expensive. Um, degrees, you know, programs obviously cost a lot more and depending on your employer, they may or may not help you with that. Um, and then there's the need. You may not need the depth and the amount of um, rigor that a master's degree will bring you. So delving into the master's degree a little bit more, um, and this actually applies to any online versus in-person considerations. You know, there are a lot of benefits to online. You have flexibility in schedule. Um, you're able to attend a program that may not be held at your local university. Um, there are a lot of concerns also, though, with um, online programs. The graduation rate for online programs is abysmal. Um, according to U.S. News, in 2013, about 17% of students who entered an online program actually completed it within three to four years. That's really low. Um, you may not have the um, network and collaboration that you get. Yeah, we, have, we have Skype, we have a lot of ways of doing it now, but it's not quite the same as sitting next to someone. Hands-on and accessibility. You can't get into a lab. Um, they may send you some equipment, but you're kind of working on it on your own, and it's not really the same. And then the last is, of course, credibility. And I will tell you, um, speaking to some of my peers at other universities and employers, um, that people do look at it a little bit differently. You know, people do think that it's a little less rigorous. I'm not making any judgment calls one way or the other. Just telling you that if this is something that you are considering, this should be something that you just um, take a look, at, look out for. Again, master's degree while working, some of the caveats and questions to ask yourself. Profe professional versus traditional programs. So everyone knows the traditional program, right? You decide, you apply to a university. Oh, I'm about to fall. Um, you apply to a university. Um, you get in. You choose your classes. Some of them are 10 o'clock on Tuesday, Thursday. Some of them are Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 2 p.m. Kind of messes with your work schedule unless you have a really flexible boss or a flexible environment. But you know, you've got to get on campus and then. TA office hours are, you know, in the middle of the day, so it can, you know, make it difficult for working professionals. Um, the professional master's degrees um, that are being offered these days, we have some now at UCSD, and um, we offer them, for example, every other week on a Friday, Saturday. Um, some of them offer classes in the evening. They're really trying to follow more the MBA structure, which was really designed for working professionals. Other things to look out for, who's teaching in the program? You want to take a look at this. Um, there may be some really good programs out there at really um, good universities. Um, 
Wash U in St. Louis has a great cybersecurity program. Um, they're taught, however, exclusively by professionals. This may be better for you. This may not be as good for you. It's really, you know, again, no judgment calls, just things that you need to be aware of. Just because it says it's at a university does not mean it's the faculty from that university teaching in the program. Is it accredited? Um, graduate programs are um, accredited, so you can look for WASC or whatever accreditation um, is valid in your state. Your student status, you know, in a professional program, there are some universities that don't actually consider their professional students uh, actual students. So they don't even have the ability to come on campus. There's no parking permit, they can't use the student services, they can't use any of the normal facilities that the university has to offer. And then support. As working professionals, um, it's probably helpful to have after hours and weekend support. Does the program have, you know, people after hours? Is the campus just closed on Saturday? You're gonna have to take off in the middle of the day to do any of the things that you need to do. What's included in the cost? Um, or does it include, you know, your books? Are you, you know, what's the total, what's the total package that you're looking at? Admission rate. You actually don't want to go to one with a really high admission rate. Like if they're admitting 100% of the people, maybe it's one of those degree mill type places. I don't know. But again, you want to look at the admission rate and you want to look at the graduation rate into these programs. When is the right time to go to one of these programs? If you're considering getting another master's degree, I really recommend um, that you work for at least two years and then you can come back at any time. Um, we have a case where there was a gentleman who actually retired from HP, a mechanical engineer, and he came back and took a, got a degree in medical device engineering, partly because his wife said, you are not going to stay at home with me every day. You need to go do something. He wasn't certain what he was going to do, and his son was actually a surgeon, and they had a medical device that they were thinking of developing. So he came back to school, um, finished the program at the ripe old age of, you know, 56, and it was amazing because he was actually gobbled up by another medical device company because at his age, with his experience, 56 is young these days, right? So he was actually looking for, um, he was actually, you know, other places wanted to hire him. They were looking for him. They had his experience and he had new relevant experience with his degree. So I already have an MS or PhD. Should I consider another master's degree? Absolutely. I can tell you um, that of our, we've had about close to 600 graduates uh, out of our program at UCSD, and I would say at least a third of them have a master's or a PhD already. And they're coming back in order to refresh or to get, you know, additional skills that they're looking for. And, you know, does it really help? You know, does this really going back and getting another degree, is it something I want to consider? Is it really going to help me? And I have another story about this. Um, Qualcomm, right here in San Diego. Um, probably San Diego's largest employer, lots of engineers there. About two years ago, they had some layoffs. Um, and they were pretty significant. It actually affected San Diego. We, um, there were a lot of people who left the area. Um, one of the engineers came to me and he, after having graduated from our program, actually sent me a very nice email and he said, you know, Took me about a month and a half, and I was able to find another job. My coworker, you know, after eight months, is still looking. I was able to um, get another position, and I think part of what made me relevant is, you know, the new degree that I received. So, um, you know, again, just one case, but I think it does help. And the other question is, are people really doing this? Are people really coming back and getting degrees? This is a list of 172 companies who have sent students to our program in the last six years. And just so you know, I do no marketing of the program. Probably none of you have heard about the program. Um, I hit a couple of our larger employers in the area, and I announce it on LinkedIn, which, by the way, if any of you are interested, please, um, you can find me on LinkedIn. And if you guys ever have any questions, I'm more than happy to help you and talk to you about any of these. But um, in seven years, this is a pretty impressive list. We have over 600 graduates. Um, 
you know, we have Fortune 500 companies who have sent. And this is actually a highlighted list of um, companies that have sent people to our wireless embedded systems program, which I think is more closely related to what um, you guys are doing. And I actually have three students who graduated from the program here, as well as a professor who teaches in our program here. So, um, you know, it's real and people are attending and it's helped you all, right? No, <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, just a quick quick um, overview of um, what, what we do. And again, we aren't, we aren't perfect, but I think we're pretty close to it. Um, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I run these programs. But um, just so you know a little bit about our program, and I'm just telling you this not to try and sell you on coming to our program, because I'm actually a local only program, but so that you know what to look for if you're considering anything like this. Um, I have four programs that we launched um, in 2011, which is actually also when I started at UCSD. We've launched a new program in data science. Um, our programs are all two-year part-time programs held on alternating weekends. I think one of the key features of our program is that there's no GRE required, so you don't have to spend three months beforehand refreshing your verbal skills and your reading skills so that you can take the GRE test. Um, we actually just base it on your work experience and letters of recommendation. We have an all-inclusive tuition model um, which ranges somewhere between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars for the two-year program. That's the complete two-year program, which includes your books, your materials, your parking, your meals, all your grad fees. So that's pretty good given you saw the range um, of uh, graduate tuition is usually somewhere between thirty and one hundred twenty thousand. Our classes are in person and taught by UCSD faculty. And this is probably the part I'm most proud of is that we keep our classes small. They're thir uh, 18 to 35 people in a class. We don't go large. It really is an opportunity for you to network. Um, I'd say a lot of the people in the program actually stay um, friends and work with each other afterwards. It's really interesting because once you start working in your career, you come to conferences like this and you may see people that you see year after year, and you may actually connect with a couple of them. But this is, um, coming into this program um, is a way that our students are actually able to build a very close network within San Diego of peers. Usually you just get that type of opportunity within your own company, but this is a way that you can actually expand your network. So with that, my parting words to you are really, Never stop learning, and I think that's true because you guys are all here today. So with that, any questions? I did such a good job. Oh, yes. Hi. Oh, thanks. So you said that there were a lot of people with um, that already have master's degrees coming back for another master's. Yes. How many of them were PhDs that were coming back for another master's? Um, I would say there are probably less of those. Um, right now I have three who have PhDs in the program out of 175. Um, that's uh, my current cohort students. But, um, but yeah, I would say the majority have been people with other master's degrees. Anything else? You have any other questions? Yeah, I actually have a couple. Yes. Oh, go for it, Jose. <laughs> so, so the first question is, why only local? Why, why aren't you expanding online? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, we've chosen to stay local. One, because we may be the youngest UC, however, we have the most backwards academic senate. Did I, are there any UC people in here? Am I going to get in trouble? None of you are going to go back to my dean, right? No. Oh, UCSD is great. I love our academic senate. No. Um, UCSD just as a whole has not embraced online education. There are a lot of concerns about online um, education. Um, our two sister schools, UCLA and UC Berkeley, both have online programs. Um, it's just a model that we have chosen at the Jacobs School not to follow. Um, Berkeley has, for example, an embedded systems um, program that's all online. We just don't think it's as effective uh, for teaching. Part of also what we're trying to do is um, give back to San Diego, um, our community. Um, 
So it's not, it's not something that we are completely opposed to. Um, and for one of our programs, to be honest, the systems engineering program, that one's very interesting because that one is half business skills and half systems engineering, and it's really systems of systems. Um, that one, actually, that's where I got all those business classes from because that, those are the relevant business skills that we're talking about. That one we actually offer a distance option to. Um, but again, part of that is because we don't have as many labs. We are really proud of having a very applied program. So we have equipment. Um, these guys here actually, you know, played with robots on the ground and stuff like that because that's how you, how we work. And that's again the model that we are, we are currently following. But we're not completely opposed to it. Yes. We got a oh. question right here. Okay. So. Uh, what's the acceptance rate for your program for the for different uh, parts actually of your program? Um, the different programs are different. I would say, you know, for my data science program, which is extremely popular right now, and we have applicants um, from everywhere, probably acceptance is probably around in the 30, 40 percent range. The other programs, I would say, are much higher. They're probably in the 60, 70 percent range. Part of that is because um, we cherry pick. I go out to um, Spaywar, I go out to Qualcomm, I go out to Broadcom, I go out to companies that I know have engineers that um, probably have the work experience and background for it. But again, that is also part of what we were um, doing and why UCSD launched these programs is that uh, our, the industry in San Diego was meeting with our dean and they said, it's great because you give us undergrads, you give us great graduate students, what can you do for our current workforce? How can you educate them? How can you get them up to speed? Because they have domain knowledge and expertise that we really want to keep them, but they may not know some of the new tools and technologies that are out there, so what can you do for them? And so we kind of came up, that's when these programs came about. Anything else? So anyways, I'll be around. Um, so if you guys have any questions, you guys are welcome to email me. And yes, I actually own Princess Faye at ucsd.edu. Um, but you know, email me, even if you're not like interested in UCSD, if you're just interested in you know, going back to school or taking some classes and you ha want an opinion or you, you know, look, take a look at this is me, would this help me, what do you think? I am more than happy to talk to you because I, this is, it's an extremely rewarding job to actually feel like you know you're helping to contribute to people's growth. So, anyways, thank you. All right, thank you, Faye. Thank you so much. Okay.